William Carey, gardener, shoemaker, pastor, missionary, translator and university professor. Let's see what one man who expected great things from God went on to do as he attempted great things for God. When William was six, his father became the local teacher. They moved to a new home and William used his big bedroom as a little zoo. He had birds and bugs and plants. He learned so much about nature that local people who had questions about something would say, go and ask Bill Carey about it. He was adventurous and very determined. One day he saw a nest in a tree and when the birds left it, he climbed up. But he fell. He was in bed for days, but as soon as he was well, he was back up that tree and he got the nest for his collection. When he was twelve, everything changed. He had to go to work. He wanted to be a gardener. You see, he loved plants and he did try very hard for two years. But the wind and the sun made him come out in a rash and although he persevered, he had to stop. He had become so ill. His father and he talked about what he should do. They heard of a shoemaker and this was a good trade. Mr Nichols, the shoemaker, trained William. But another man was also there and he was a believer, just like William's father was. William loved the things God made, that's true, but he didn't love the God who made them. He didn't think, you see, he needed a saviour. And then one day he was sent to buy some things for Mr Nichols. He spent too much on himself and as he had a counterfeit coin, he put that into the change. Mr Nichols spotted it and in the end William admitted he had spent the money and tried to cheat Mr Nichols. He thought he'd be sacked but he was forgiven. And now William knew he was a liar, a cheat and a sinner. He found a quiet place and knelt to ask the Lord Jesus to save him, not only from the punishment for sin, but also from his own sinful heart. The Lord had died for sinners and Carey got up from his prayer knowing that God had forgiven him and that he was a new person. He wanted to live for the Lord from that day on. Sadly, after a while, Mr Nichols died and William went to complete his apprenticeship with another cobbler. But he too eventually died. The man had a wife and children and William decided he would stay and support them and work in the shoemaker's shop. But he didn't earn enough. What could he do? So he opened an evening school for grown-ups who hadn't learned to read and they paid him for it. One day he was lent a book. It was Captain Cook's Voyages. He began to think of all the places in the world where explorers had gone, but missionaries hadn't yet gone. Captain Cook had written that he thought people would travel to faraway countries to get rich or to become famous, but no one would go there to preach the gospel. William began to pray that God would send people to speak to those people in those distant countries and win them to his son. He made a map from different pieces of leather and wrote down just how many people lived in each country and which gods and idols they worshipped. His heart became more and more concerned but what could he do? He was just a poor shoemaker with no money and no skills. William had been asked to speak at different churches. He also had to make and mend shoes. He ran a school in the evening and he had to study and prepare his messages. One person told him to keep to his business, but he told that man his business was to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for sinners. He said he was a shoemaker to pay his own expenses. Another man 
more kindly said, I will pay your salary if you will leave work and just preach the gospel. William was thrilled. When he met with other ministers, he asked them once to discuss the time the Lord said, Go into all the world to make disciples of all the nations. He was still so concerned that so many people in so many countries had never yet heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. One older man stood up and said, Young man, if God intends to save those people, he'll do it without your help. But William was determined something should be done. A friend told him to write something down and make sure everyone knew of the opportunities and the need all over the world, and he did it. When he preached that message to the ministers, they were very stirred and thoughtful, but he had hardly finished before the men began to talk about other things. It seemed they thought the task was too big for village pastors to do anything about it. But Mr Fuller, a friend of William's, grabbed his arm and told him not to be discouraged. William asked him, are we going to do nothing? But as they talked, they remembered a doctor who had returned from India who wanted to go back. They would invite him to talk to the pastors about India. Well, you can guess the outcome. The doctor came and spoke. He said he wanted to go back, but he needed a preacher missionary to go with him. Well, William stood up. It was as if God was prompting him and he said, I'll go. Can you guess what his wife said? She said, well, I won't. His church members also wanted him to stay and preach for them, but he was determined. What do you think happened? Well, William's wife changed. She became willing and the church and the other churches around agreed to support and pray for William and Dr Marsh as they went off to India. After a few months, the doctor and William, with his wife and boys, got into that ship for India. What a journey it was. Five months of adventure. One day, a storm damaged the boat. Another time, for two weeks, the weather was so bad they hardly moved an inch forward. But Carey wasn't lazy. The journey was 15,000 miles by sea, right round the bottom of Africa. And William used all that time to learn Bengali, to lead worship and teach passengers about the saviour of sinners. He was a missionary wherever he was wasn't he? When they arrived, they were actually illegal immigrants. The British government didn't allow missionaries in India. Soon, the Carey's money was gone and they had nothing. One day, as they wondered and wondered what to do, they met another Englishman. He had his gun and a dog. But, to their surprise, he offered them a place to live in his big house as long as they wanted. As William and Dr Marsh walked around in the city, they saw there were people everywhere in India. He'd never seen so many, thousands of them, millions of them, and none of them knew of God's love in sending his son to pay the penalty for sin. Worse, there were idols everywhere too, in homes, on the streets, in temples, everywhere. It seemed William had an impossible task. And then one day William saw a man, suspended from hooks, tied with ropes to long poles. That man thought that if he suffered all that pain, his gods would forgive his sin and be pleased with him. William's heart ached. Another day he saw a most horrible sight. A woman's husband had died 
and it was the custom when he was cremated to burn her alive with her husband's body. The people thought that she would go to paradise and be the dead man's wife there. Well, William tried to stop it right away, but he couldn't. From that day on, he was determined to end that cruelty. William would go into the streets and speak and preach. People had begun to realise he was a good man. He gave beggars food, he opened a school, he told them of a loving God. But although they listened, no one trusted. He prayed and he prayed, he studied, he learned a number of their languages. What more could he do? Well, he spent five and a half years translating the New Testament into Bengali. He knew that if he could get the Bible into the people's hands and hearts, that was the answer. But how could he get it copied? He had thousands of handwritten pieces of paper with the New Testament on it. Then he heard that a wooden printing press was for sale. They were very rare in India. He prayed and God answered that prayer when a supporter bought the printing press for him. Well, when the local people saw how happy William was as he worked with the big printing press, they thought it must be Carey's God and he was worshipping it. But William said it wasn't his God, but that the printing press would help them know about the true and living God who loved India and wanted to save the people and had sent his son to be that saviour and his son had died upon the cross for them. But who would run the printing press? William wasn't able to do everything. He prayed again. Believing that the God who sent the printing press surely would be able to send a printer to use it. And that is exactly what happened. He got a letter from a man who said he was ready to spend the rest of his life in India serving the Lord and his trade. He was a printer. He arrived with others helpers too and soon the work was going forward. One day, to Carey's surprise and joy, an Indian man turned up at the door and told William, I've asked Christ to save me. I want to be baptised. His name was Krishna Pal. Krishna Pal's neighbours were furious. They did many bad things. They kidnapped Krishna's daughter. They beat him and they were going to kill him. But the governor of the area heard about it, came and rescued him. It was a narrow escape. Now they had the New Testament, they would go to a villager and ask, can you read? Often that person said no, but someone in the village could read. William would say, give this book to him and tell him to read it to you every day. And that is what happened in many, many places. God's word was being read in Indian villages and towns for the very first time in all of history. One man named Krishna Das read it to his village. Soon many people were believing and they decided they wanted to thank the person who gave it to them, but they didn't know his name. However, in the Bible they were reading from, it said that it had been printed in Serampur. So they set off to Serampur to say thank you to whoever had printed it. Jagannath Das, Sebak Ram, Gabardham, what strange names they are to us. Well, these three men set off for Serampore, and astonishingly, they found William, and they told him, we are believers. It had taken seven years before one person came to the Lord, and now through reading the New Testament, 
others were trusting the Saviour as they read his word. There were now five printing presses working all the time to get the New Testaments out in many of the Indian languages. Carey was overjoyed. But then there was a disaster. The printing house caught fire. Thousands of pages of many translations were destroyed. A lot of paper was burned up. Carey was so upset. But he was a determined man. He thought that maybe he had been too proud of his work and that God had sent this trial to humble him. So he prayed and he decided he would begin again to make better translations and he worked harder than ever to make sure it happened. God was kind. Bengali doesn't have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It is a lot of what seemed to us to be squiggles that they write in. And the letters that were used for printing were made of lead and it had all melted. But they found the tools to make them all again safe in the ashes of the fire. Because Carey knew so many languages, he was then asked to teach languages in the government college in Calcutta. You see, so many people came to India and they didn't know how to speak in Bengali or Hindi or any of the other local languages. William was thrilled at the privilege. He would lecture in the day for four days after taking a boat from his house down to the city. Then, in the evening, he would talk and translate and study, and the government paid him, and it meant he could use that money to help the poor, to run a school, to pay for all the paper needed to print the Bibles. He was now respected and loved by local people and by the people who ruled in India. William had another thing he wanted to do. He wanted to train local people to become evangelists and pastors. And so he prayed and saved and worked to open a Bible college in India. At last, his dream came true. And slowly, mature and upright believers from India began to become educated and ready to serve their churches as their pastors. A long time had passed. William had become an old man. He couldn't go on all his travels, but as he sat and prayed and still preached and translated, he must have been astonished that a poor shoemaker from England could be used by God to get the gospel into so many Indian languages. The Bible, you see, was now available in 34 languages and 19 printing presses were at work constantly to print even more. 26 churches existed. Hundreds of people were saved from the worship of idols and trying to earn their salvation. But only now, toward the end of his life, did William finally hear the news that all his efforts behind the scenes to get the burning of widows banned had been made law. He felt his life's work was complete. Well, shortly before William died, a Mr Duff came to visit him and they talked about the past. But as he left, William said to Mr Duff, you have been speaking about William Carey, when I am gone, do not speak about how great William Carey was. Instead, speak of how great William Carey's God is. And so William Carey's life and work for the Lord came to its close. He said at the beginning, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. At the end, 
When he was asked what was the secret of his life's work, he said, I can plod. And that's it. He could face each day and take another step forward with the Lord. He could pray, commit the day to God. He could study and speak and live and serve the Lord Jesus just for that day. And that is something anyone who has trusted in the Saviour can do, no matter how ordinary a person they are. It's something you could do. Every boy or girl can begin by trusting in the Lord Jesus and then living each day for the Lord, but thinking something like this, what shall I do with my one very short life? How shall I serve the Lord? Who shall I be a blessing to? Will you do that? Will you do that today? God bless you all.